Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Madiha and I'm the program manager at Dignity Foundation's NCR chapter. A very warm welcome to all our chapter heads, coordinators, members, and guests, and our resource person, Mr. Krishan Kaldra. For the benefit of those who are attending Dignity Foundation's must Chai Masti program for the first time, I'd like to begin with telling them a little about our program. Dignity Foundation's Shai Masti program provides a platform for senior citizens to engage and connect with peers, make new friends, display their talents, learn new skills, and lead a happy and active life. So if any one of you is a senior citizen looking for companionship, this is the place to be. For people who would like to become members of our Chai Masti program, can connect with us on our helpline number, which will be displayed in the chat box. Coming back to today's session, Potpourri of Everyday Life. It is a collection of middles by Mr. Krishan Kaldra, published in mainline dailies like the Times of India, Hindustan Times, Express, and others. About 300 of these short stories appeared in print during the period to, from 1986 to 2008. And the author has selected 100 of them to make this compendium. Mr. Kaldra is a retired senior business executive who has served as president of the All India Management Association and Delhi Management Association. He was the member of the Board of Governors of Indian Institute of Mass Communication, additional secretary, secretary general of PICI and secretary general of PhD Chamber of Commerce. In addition to middles, he has also published a very large number of articles on a wide range of subjects. And since 2010, he has done some voluntary work in the areas of climate change, healthcare, empowerment of persons with disabilities. So today in this session, we will get to learn from Mr. Kalra what made him write this book. And he would also be reading a few pieces from his book. And before beginning the session, a small request from members to please keep themselves muted during the session. And a small word of caution that if any time during the session you are logged out, please use the same link to join us again. I would now request Mr. Kalra to please begin the session. Thank you very much, Madeha. And uh, I'm grateful to all those people. I can see 100 people already joined the talk. Uh, my grateful thanks to my dear friend Vijay Pawa, who suggested the idea, and to Archana, who sort of uh, helped me reach here where I am today. Just a minor correction, Madhya, in my <clears throat> introduction. IIMC, what I meant was IIM Calcutta and not Indian Institute of Mass Communication. I have nothing to do with that. Thank you for the correction. <laughs> no, no, I, I had written short, so that's not your fault at all. What I'm going to do is, if that is okay with you and with Archana, I would first read one or two of the stories from the book, just to give an idea to all friends gathered here today about you know, a flavor of the book as to what is it about, what is the range of the kind of stories that the book contains. And uh, after that, I'd like to spend five minutes uh, talking about how and why I came to writing the book are publishing the book. And uh, finally, after that, if there is time, I would like to read another three or four stories also if there is. So here I go with my first story, uh, which is uh, the title of the story is To Each His Own. <clears throat> and this goes under the chapter, Men Will Be Men. The whole book is divided into five or six different chapters. Men will be when unbelievable, but true, uh, you know, on foreign shows and things like that. There are many of them there. And the title, as I said, is to each his own. There were four of us in that handsome double-story house in Alipur, ideally located, well-maintained, and adequately provided for. It was the ultimate luxury. Four bright young executives. Here I want to share a disclaimer. This is not a personal experience. This was narrated to me by
by one or two friends of our son. So this did not happen. I wish it had happened, but it did not happen with me. That I never, I was never a banker, and I never lived in Calcutta like that. It was the ultimate luxury. Four bright young executives working for a big foreign bank, each one fond of the good life. We were a happy lot. The chamari even had a resident cook come bearer, so there were no hassles of buying groceries and vegetables. The guy cooked exceedingly well and did all the shopping. We took turns clearing his weekly bills. Trained by British employers, he knew all the graces. We didn't doubt his integrity. Oh. Anyway, who cared if he was charging us for his chai pani? Besides, the old man took care of everything. Laundry, shoes, all the odd chores. Our booze bottles were kept in the dining room sideboard. No one thought of locking up. It had started with a drink and special locations, but soon a chota before dinner became the order of the day. Bottles were purchased turn by turn, usually one of the IMFL brands. Once in a while, someone chipped in with a scotch. <clears throat> it happened with a particularly good bottle of scotch. We noticed the level was depleting rather fast. Maybe we were watching more closely. Maybe it was our banker mentality working over time. But there was a distinct feeling that someone was giving us company, taking a nip on the sly. We started level marking the bottle. The pilferage continued. The guy wasn't even smart. Otherwise, he could have added water. We were, we were baffled, doubting the cook was unthinkable. But who else would have the opportunity except the person who was around all the time? The level in our precious bottle was now dangerously low. That evening, when we started dinner, there were only a few pegs left. We decided to teach the rogue a lesson. He wasn't going to get away with this robbery. He wasn't going to make a fool of four savvy bankers. The swine was going to pay for his sins. The bottle was quietly taken to the loo. One of the guys peed in it. My apologies. <laughs> One of the guys peed in it and the loss of our chotas was made up. The bottle was duly replaced on the sideboard. Next evening, it was the same story. The plunderer had struck again and drunk a patiala. This one was obviously beyond redemption. He didn't even know the difference between scotch and Muraji's portion. It had to be the cook. We decided not to wait any longer. We were going to take the bull by the horns. After dinner, we would join, jointly summon him and pose the question. Dinner over, the old man was called and the damning evidence placed before him. Who's the thief in this house? I thundered. Who's been drinking our good whiskey? The man was unruffled. His response was cool. Saab, I don't touch the stuff. I am a teetotaler. But I know it makes the food tastier. So I just add two spoons in the main dish every day. That night, we all threw up turn by turn. Now that's one kind of story, uh, which as I said, is that this chapter, uh, when will be when. I would now read a story which is totally a different genre. <clears throat> now this one goes into the chapter, unbelievable, but true. And the title of the story is In Life and Death. This is a true story narrated to me by my parents, my grandparents. Pandit Bishambar Lal was the official pujari in the Sanatan Dharam Mandir at Sargodha. Sargodha is the place where our family lived. I was about seven years old when the partition happened. So we moved here. Sargodha, a small town in West Pakistan. Vishambar Lal was not only the pujari, he also doubled as the Shastri and read from the scriptures every afternoon. He wasn't there because he had bribed any high-powered managing committee or because his father before him had done the same job. He was there simply because the people of Sargodha loved and admired this humble man who was their friend, philosopher and guide in many difficult situations. Panditji as he was fondly called by everyone in the town, had been the pujari for five decades. 
he took care of the murtis in the sanctum sanctorum while his wife the pandita as she was called swept and scrubbed the rest of the modest temple he was there when the people visited the temple early in the morning applying tilak on their foreheads and giving out charnamrut and prasad later he would make some house calls for various pujas shraddhs vidrudars marriages mundans births deaths whatever he was wherever he was needed afternoon was reserved for discourses from the scriptures first reading shlokas in sanskrit and then translating them in simple everyday punjabi evenings again people came to pay obeisances especially on tuesdays and pandit ji would be there to help them he was indeed a part of life of everyone in the sleepy little town and for all his pains pandit ji got two simple meals a day and a few sets of rough home wash kurta dhotis the man just didn't want anything else for himself all the collection the mandir went to charity one morning while doing his surya namaskar after the routine daily bath at the canal pandit ji collapsed and died instantaneously other bathers it is quite the done thing for most people to go and bathe at the canal other bathers rushed to help but there was no life left in the old man the saintly man had departed peacefully without any fuss and without any botheration to anyone so typical of his life <clears throat> someone ran and got a tonga and carried the body to the mandir and the one room apartment behind it where the old couple lived another person informed the lady as the body was kept in the mandir courtyard pandita and came and quietly touched her dead husband's feet in a low composed voice she told the gathering to wait for her as she also wanted to accompany her husband to the cremation ground give me a few minutes to get ready she said and went into her room people were aghast women those days did not go with funeral processions yet she had asked them to wait so they didn't have a choice half an hour passed but there was no sign of the old lady all arrangements had been made and they didn't want to delay the cremation they would again try to dissuade her once she came out <coughs> excuse me one of the ladies went and knocked at the door there was no response she knocked again still no response she pushed the door gently it was open inside the pandita and sat in samadhi as she touched her shoulder the lifeless figure just rolled down to the floor the women shrieked and more people rushed inside someone felt to for the pulse there was none the lady had indeed succeeded in accompanying her husband on his final journey now uh, that's why i put it in the chapter unbelievable but true uh, this is what happened this piece was published in the times of india in on 4th of january 1997 i didn't share the uh, the, the details about the first piece that was also carried in times of india uh, in 1995 i want to now spend as i said 5 minutes about how did i come to write this medals and how and why this craving came to me you know it was in 1954 and i had joined a new school called the technical higher secondary school at delhi in class 8 i came from a family which was uprooted as i mentioned earlier in 1947 and really for almost 10 12 years the family lived on a shoestring budget it lived so it was not for me to go to a convent school or to a good english medium school i went to municipal board schools and then i went to this school and in between another charity school called the dav school so speaking and reading and writing english was a challenge for me. but at the same time that challenge inspired me to make sure that i was able to learn the queen's language the so called queen's language so in 1954 when i uh, you know and i was told that by writing and reading more that's the only way to do that because my parents had never gone to college they did not speak english they did not write english they did not read english that by writing and reading 
but I didn't have the courage to try and write an article in English, my first article. So I wrote a, a Hindi article, article about a visit to a mill in Delhi. It was called Birla Milka Brahman, where we were taken by our teachers to see the mill. And it was simply describing what had happened there and what had we seen there. It was published. The editors chose it and it was published. Then I wrote another Hindi uh, article called Nani Tal Ki Sair, where my elder brother, who was an army officer, he took me there for two weeks. And uh, so both these articles were published in the school magazine, which gave me quite a kick. And then I started writing to the newspaper. Uh, sorry, then I started attempting my first article in English after a couple of years. And that was for the college magazine. And it was quite a technical article, so it was easier for me to write because it was describing uh, some technical achievement, engineering achievement. It was titled Cantilever Bridges of India. So that inspired me, that excited me, that made me very happy. And that's how I started writing. In 1960, my elder brother, about whom I mentioned earlier, wrote a letter to the statesman, which he did not want to be published under his byline. So he asked me, he said, you be the ghost uh, uh, sort of uh, name, byline to it, and you send this. The letter was carried by the statesman in 1960, and that really, you know, put me in high heaven. I thought I'd arrived. One of my letters had been published by such a celebrated newspaper like the, the statesman, and, uh, you know, which took pride in. So I really got hooked. And I got a big kick out of this. And I started writing to all the newspapers. So these were letters. Letters were carried, some were carried, some were not carried. But almost all the newspapers carried this letter. Incidentally, I have written to date two to 3,000 these letters also. I still do that once in a while. In some of the papers, I do that. Then I started writing professional articles, which were more about the subject that I was uh, studying, the engineering degree for, I was studying for are the work that I was doing. These also got published. But all this time, I craved to write a middle. You know, this middle, most of the people in this audience would not know what is a middle because all newspapers stopped carrying middles from 2005. For whatever was the reason, <clears throat> they stopped carrying it. This used to appear smack in the middle of the edit page. A short story between 400 to 600 uh, words, maximum 600, minimum 400 words. And that was, believe me, the first thing I read when I opened a newspaper in the morning. I, I always admired those people whose, uh, you know, they were famous names uh, there, who be people who were writing was middle of the publish. There are people like Colonel C.L. Proudfoot, one of the earliest uh, writers of the middle, Raj Chatterjee, uh, General M. N. Batra, and several others, uh, uh, this uh, gentleman uh, uh, who still writes, who continues to write for the Times of India, um, Jag Suraya, that I'm sure you would have read his, uh, but now they don't carry any middles from outsiders. It's their own internal people who do that. So I started composing middles, writing middles, and my secretary would help me type them out. I would write them in longhand, and he would send it to one newspaper, came back with a rejection slip and sent it to another newspaper, then to third, fourth, like that. And I had quite a pile of rejection slip that came. Finally, I think it was in 1986 when my first medal was carried by the Times of India. I was, you know, it was, it was so awesome that I was absolutely delighted. And I thought, oh my God, I've arrived. I've become an author now. Now they will publish my medals every time. Next one year, again, no middle was published. <laughs> and everything came back from the newspapers that it did. After one year, almost, Indian Express carried the newspaper, uh, which I would try and read today. There is time. The title was Those Were the Days, uh, particularly at a time when you know there are tensions between different communities and all. I want to recall some of those uh, things that had happened. Then again, there was a... Uh, you know, drought for several months. I got a call one morning from the middle's editor, one of the sub-editors uh, from Hindustan Times. 
And he said, Mr. Kalra, you seem to be very keen. We have received lots of submissions for you from you. We have rejected all of them. Why don't you come and see me and I'll give you some tips about how to write a middle which would should get accepted by most newspapers. I said, sir, that's fantastic. I can come right away because his office at the start of the Times house was bang opposite my office <clears throat> on what is called Kastur Bagadi Park. It used to be called Karzan Road at that time. He said, no, no, not that hurry. I will give you a time day after you come at such and such time. So I went there, walked across his office, and this good man spent almost uh, an hour with me. He gave me a cup of tea and he gave me a few tips about what should a middle be really. And, uh, and I will uh, read out a small paragraph to you how a middle was described by Shekhar Gupta, the well-known journalist who launched my book actually in 2016. And let me read this. He, he writes, we've all grown up with the middle, the short slice of life piece, where else but in the middle of the edit pages, giving a break from pontification and bringing a smile to our faces. In the general, Krishan Kalra has been a wonderful byline. His pieces, a selection of which is published in this book, never failing to tickle, touch and tug at your heart and mind. So these middles actually have no substance in them. It's any ordinary happening in a day's in a day in life, which uh, you know you've got to capture, you've got to make notes, and then you've got to write about it, and that's how it will. The qualifications are: it does should not exceed maximum six hundred word. It should have a bit of a punchline. It should have a touch of humor. Either one of them, or an anticlimax, or any such thing to give a kind of a twist to the story, if that is possible. If you can <clears throat> build all these things, that becomes a middle and general. I'm sure his <clears throat> teaching was good because I went on to write about uh, almost 400 of these pieces by now. Now it's only the magazine, some of the magazines which carry them and not them. So that was my story, How I, Then uh, sometime in the 90s, or uh, sorry, in the 2010 or around that time, some friends suggested, why don't you publish a collection of your book? I said, who's going to read these? These are stories which my friends, or my family, they kind of relate to them because they know me and they know my life. But why would anyone else want to read uh, such? They said, no, 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 you do that. So I went to see a publisher in, in all the way to Okla. And the publisher said, yes, uh, Mr. Kalra, we will make a book for you. You'll have to pay for it. I said, what do you mean pay for it? I've never heard of authors paying for getting the books published. He said, no, no, you are mistaken. These are called vanity publications. And almost everyone, barring the very well-known authors, pay for them to publish. I said, thank you very much, sir. I'm not going to pay. He said, I'm only asking for 50,000 rupees. I said, I'm not only going to pay 50 rupees if I have to pay to get my stories. So, two years later, one publisher called. He had probably read some of my medals. And I think Times of India in 2009 had published a collection of 84 of these stories, out of which four of them are mine. I was, only, I was the only one who uh, got four stories there. Everyone else had three, two, or one story like that. So he says, uh, uh, we'd like to publish a book. I said, are you going to ask me to pay for it? They said, no, no, we're not going to. We'll pay for it, but we'll give you no royalty for the first 1,000 or 2,000 books. I said, that's okay. That's perfectly all right. So then everything happened in email. I sent them the stories. They kind of did the editing, this, that, and all that. And they that's how the book was published and launched in 2016. I'm very happy to get this chance like today to share some of these stories uh, with friends, with groups of people who have interest in them. Now I'll ask uh, uh, Madhya Rachana whether I should uh, read any more stories or you want me to take any questions. Uh, what should I do? So we will be very happy to hear more stories. Please go ahead. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay. Uh... 
Okay, let me read a nostalgic story. I mentioned the title, I think, What Happened to Those Days. And I was inspired to read this today because three or four days ago on the WhatsApp circuit in one of the groups, uh, there was a poem uh, by Gulzar. And Gulzar Saab is the ultimate writer and poet he is. And he uh, lamented <clears throat> what is happening today in the country. And uh, you know, the, the, anyone who's interested, I'll forward that also. So that reminded me of this old story, which was published in the Indian Express in uh, 1987. Yeah, it was my second middle lecture after that first one in the Times of India. <clears throat> For almost two decades after the partition, we lived in an old Haveli in one of the narrow lanes in Old Delhi. Our gully was in a predominantly Hindu area, but very close to a Muslim area. We lived in harmony as neighbors. One Muslim couple shared a big courtyard with about 10 Hindu families and 20 buffaloes. They lived like one big family, all of them supplying milk to the whole mohalla. The Delhi Milk Scheme and Mother Dairy had not yet come into existence. Perhaps the unprecedented drama of the partition had mellowed everyone. People had become more humane. In summer, men slept on string cots on rooftops with small surais of water by their side. Uh, for those younger people who don't know what is a surai, it's an earthen pot, a smaller pot rather than a big matka. It's an earthen pot by their side for quenching thirst. Since all houses had common walls, children offer, often walked across the low dividing parapet for a chat after playing cards. Even though the surais were not shared, one thought nothing of Muslim sleeping only a few steps away. <clears throat> My father had a shop in Kharibab. The easiest way to reach it was either to cycle down to the holy Muslim area to Jama Masjid. <clears throat> one went through places like you wouldn't have heard the name Chitli Kabar and Matya Mahal. Then from Jama Masjid through Chavdi Bazar and Nai Sadak to Ghanta Ghar and Chandni Chowk, Fatehpuri and finally the congested wholesale market of Khari Babli with all its hand carts and tongas and mouth-watering kachoris and dai bhallas. Alternately, one could walk to Jama Masjid and ride a tram from there to Fatehpuri for only one hour. It clanged the way through Esplanade Road, uh, more popularly known as the Cycle Market, and Chandni Chow. My father and uncle cycled to the shop and back every day, sometimes returning even at 10 p.m. And no one even thought about any danger and route that they were passing through a literally holy Muslim area. Even we school-going children did this once in a while, walking without fear through all those streets full of patang shops, silver leaf makers, dawa khanas, and kebab stand. One would often be greeted by the shopkeepers who knew my father, and sometimes one of them would even give a sweet or a kite. We celebrated Eid with almost the same enthusiasm as our Muslim neighbors. They also burst crackers and shared our sweets during Diwali. We treated them in the same manner as our Hindu neighbors of the same social milieu. For many years, we got our milk supply from the Muslim dairyman. Muslim children played with all others in the street, and together, both Hindu and Muslim children queued up for free charge, as buttermilk is called, from our house. What happened to all that? What happened to those days? You know, one can often think about it and wonder as to what is it. Who brought this change? Is it the politician? Is it the situation? Is it the economy? Or whatever it is. But the fact is that we all know how things have changed. Let me come to another story, which is, <clears throat> again, which has a bit of a humor. And the, the chapter title is All in a Day's Work. And the title of the story is Target Practice. This happened a few days before our son's wedding. And our son's wedding happened in 1995. The house was full of relatives. There were many visitors every day, festivities, endless phone calls, generally a lot of activity, and as usual, a lot of confusion as it happened in the wedding, particularly Punjabi weddings. As the phone rang one evening, perhaps I picked it up a few seconds late, not realizing that the servant had already answered from the other. Uh, telephone. This was a parallel line. 
uh, answered and informed the lady at the other end that Deep, our son, wasn't home. The moment I said hello, there was an angry retort. So you are sitting at home and telling the servant to take off the collars? I was taken aback, but made an excuse that the servant perhaps didn't know I was in. I also ventured to ask who the caller was. This time, the response was even more harsh. So now you don't even know my name, you such and such. After all the trouble I've gone to finding your number, I had to make so many calls. Anyway, since you refuse to recognize friends now, I'll let you know. This is Vinita. Hi, Vinita. How are you? I mustered courage to say. This was curious. Only the other day, we had gone and delivered the invitation cards to end Mithai to our friends Vinita and Surinder Pawa. Now, there was a big confusion taking place because I thought it was our friend Vinita, whereas the one who was calling was some other Vinita. And here she was talking about finding her number. Why was she being so difficult? Had we slipped up and not delivered all the cards? You know, I'm sure you're familiar that weddings often have more than one function and then you decide and make an elaborate list whether you're going to put all the three cards, the four cards, and five cards in the envelope, or you're going to put only one or two, or whatever it may be. So, you know, it put me really in a dizzy as to what had happened. Had we slipped up and not delivered all the cards? Was there something wrong with the Mithai? Had we forgotten to write with family on the envelope? That can be another problem, because if you don't write, then some people would take it amiss. A hundred thoughts crossed my mind. But our numbers are on the card I added. I like that, she piped up. Who the hell has got the card? That's what I wanted to tell you. Really, I'll have to come and sort this out with you, Mr. Kalra, so and so. By now, I was thoroughly confused. Why was she playing games? Or was it another Vinita we knew and I just couldn't recall? My mind was working furiously, but I couldn't, for the love of God, come up with any answer. Aren't you Vinita Pawa? I decided to take the bull by the heart. How many Vinitas do you know, Mr. Casanova? I'm not going to take this inside. I must come and whack you. Now she was shouting like a idiot. I needed time to think. Listen, Vinita, this is getting serious. I'm confused and I also have guests. Give me your number and I'll call you in 15 minutes. Condescendingly, she rattled off a number. I poured myself a stiff drink and sat down to think. All this time, it never crossed my mind that it could be one of our son's friends. And our voices were quite uh, similar. Just then, our son, Deep, walked in. The moment he heard my tale of woes, he knew it was his friend, Vinita Toli Khanna. He dialed the number, and before he had a chance to say much, there was another flowering comment. So now you know who you are talking to. Unlike me, he was ready. Wait till you find out whom you were talking to. And he told her the story. Poor girl was distraught. She even considered going back to Bangalore without attending the wedding. She didn't want to face me. Throughout the wedding function, she tried to avoid me. She was just too embarrassed for words. And of course, there was no backing. So this is, this is a, again a story which happened, which is a real story, real life story, personal uh, uh, experience <clears throat> where this thing happened. Shall I go ahead with one more story if there is time? Yes, I sir. Yes, sir. I think there is time for one more. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me choose one. Okay. I will not now talk about a situation that happened. Uh, you know, it's under the chapter on foreign shores that happened in the US of A. And this story was published in the Hindu Sun Times in 1988. The name of the story is Dinner at Rainier's. Rainier's incidentally is, or at least was, because it's an old story, uh, one of the popular uh, uh, restaurants in New York, uh, rather on the expensive side, but a, quite a popular one anyway. It was a classy joint. <coughs> I'd often walk past it but never dared to enter. Excuse me.
<coughs> it was a classy joint. I had often walked past it, but never dared to enter. Indians visiting America on a per diem allowance. Those days, there used to be a very small allowance when we traveled uh, abroad, fixed by the Reserve Bank of India. We couldn't really afford to cross the hallowed portals of places like the Rainiers at the Sheraton Center in New York. On this particular occasion, I landed up there because of sheer bravado. This was in the late 70s. I'd invited a Swedish client to dinner and made the mistake of asking him to suggest the restaurant. I should have known. You don't eat at such places with your own money. Here we were, my client, his Indian wife, and an outwardly gregarious me being ushered in by a very elegantly dressed Martin Day. I was on an expense account, so I could sort of uh, 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 spend a little money at that time. Naturally, the table would take some time, and so we could, could enjoy a drink at the bar. Frankly, we did enjoy our drinks, at least my guests did, and notwithstanding my fear of having less greenbacks than the bill amount, I also enjoyed. I thought the scotch was genuine, because those were the days when mostly you got spurious stuff here in India. It is only overseas that you realize about the ingenuity of the bootlegger back home who never gives you the real stuff. The sparkling crystal, the silver nut bowls, and complimentary canopies were all exquisite. The service courteous and attentive. All around, we could see beautiful people, the glitterati of New York. A couple of drinks later, another beautiful apparition came and escorted us to our table. The napery, china, crystal, and cutlery were all elegant. The moment we were seated came the wine steward with an elaborate menu. My heart sank on seeing the prices, and I silently prayed for better sense to my guest ordering a relatively inexpensive California wine. Then followed the ordering of food, odivers, soup, entree, and dessert. Everything was served with a plum, Wine tasting and pouring thereafter was a ceremony in itself. The waiters were all solicitors. They walked rather sailed on rubber soled shoes, and there was one always at your elbow when you wanted something. Food was good and the wine reasonable. It flowed endlessly. When the dessert arrived, we were pretty well satiated. satiated. The Irish coffee was even better. Made on the table, complete with the burning snake like orange peel and whiskey poured over it almost like a sorcerer's egg. By the end of it all, we were feeling good and I was ready to give a generous, at least by my standard, tip. It was with some trepidation that I asked for the check. As you're all aware, in America, they don't call it a bill, they call it a check. It was placed before me with a flourish on a beautiful silver salver. Right on top was a printed slip. May we suggest, and believe me, it's a real story, I'm not exaggerating at all. May we suggest, <clears throat> in order to appreciate the service, you tip a minimum of 15% for the waiter and another 5% for the captain. For almost a minute, I was dumbfounded because I had never experienced a thing like that before. I recovered from the shock to ask my friend's wife in Hindi as to what should I do. She shrunk resignedly, resignedly and suggested <clears throat> I do the bidding. With a feeling of utter disgust, I placed my three days allowance on the salver. I wanted to pick up the slip as a souvenir, but was not allowed. That's for us, sir, said the waiter. With the same finesse and without batting an eyelid, he took the tray and promptly brought back the receipt and the change. This time, I was in for another shock. The blank receipt, duly stamped and initiated an initial did not show any amount. When I pointed out, the waiter informed me with an obliging smile that it was my prerogative to fill up the safe. So it was a classic case of, you know, rubbing each other's back. You give them a good tip and then you can write any amount and claim that from your office. That is what the, happened in America way back in the 80s. A real American way of mutual back scratching and exploiting their fat expensive power. 
So this is <laughs> one, one is one is always learning. At least one was always learning when we were traveling, because those days one did not travel very often to those places, and when one did, there were all these hassles of a restricted daily allowance and a very small entertainment allowance and things like that. So this is one of those occasions. Okay, uh, time for one more story. I think we should uh, close because it's just. Uh, five seven minutes left, and okay. ask anyone for any comments, any questions, any. Uh... <clears throat> Great, Vijay. I don't see your picture on it, but that's I'm... Vijay. I'm sure. <laughs> no, no. You, I, I... you 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 got better pictures to look at than me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I had not run through all of them, so that's why. <laughs> so, Madhya, why won't you uh, coordinate that part? Uh, thank you so much, sir, for sharing such an inspire, your inspiring journey with us and such wonderful and interesting short story. Thank so, you. So uh, now we'll open the fourth floor for interaction. And if anybody has any questions, any comments to make, please unmute yourself and uh, you can go ahead. I can see all the smiling faces. Everybody's really happy after hearing your story, sir. Mm. Uh, can I? <clears throat> I am uh, Nirbala speaking uh, from Delhi. Yes, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. Congratulations. Because even I am in the hobby of writing. I have written two or three Thank books. you. Thank so you, Nirbala. Thank you very it's much. A, it's, it is such a pleasure to listen. For a little while, you reach the world. It seems that you are in the same way. You have done a lot of good work. 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 And keep on writing. Thank, Thank you so much. You. Let me just add a line here in response. <clears throat> All of us have such a situation. The only thing that I do is, which most of the people don't do it, I keep a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil in my pocket all the time, and I'll just jot down. And then whenever I get the time late in the evening, uh, I would sit down, and these days one has a computer, uh, to 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 key it in. Those days it used to be a uh, uh, you know hard copy. One would write. Of course, I must give all credit to my wife who had to bear with it. My late night sitting and writing, and she would often say another middle. <laughs> and she's sitting here and watching and attending this uh, session also. So that's how it came up. Everyone can. Once a friend, I remember a friend asked me. He says, why do these interesting things happen only with you? I said, no, you're wrong. They don't happen only with me. They happen with all of us. And these are all ordinary things happening in a uh, uh, day in a life. And if one is inclined to write, then one is, what one has to do is just jot down the point because otherwise one would forget. Okay. That reminds me during uh, my time, uh, yeah. there used to be something called at the end of the day, you wrote a diary. You know, date-wise, no, no. date I... there was a Shamko Baitke, whatever has happened during the day, used to write it down. Yeah. My, <laughs> my, father, my father did it. I did it for a very long time. And I wish I'd saved those uh, uh, during any number of transfers that I've had in my career. <laughs> yeah, well, I think you're right, Vijay. <laughs> That's what happened. So there are very complimentary messages coming in the chat. Um, in fact, this is from somebody uh, from Chennai, I believe, Mr. Thomas Korean, and he writes that you remind me of our dear late Mr. Kushwant Singh. Oh, wow. great man, Kushwant Singh. <laughs> Kushwant Singh's stories are in another. Uh, he was a legend. He was a legend. Is, is Our good. advisory council member, Mr. Love Varma, says, fascinating, great choice of medals. Thank you. I'm honored. <laughs> and of course, there are many more appreciative messages. Interesting, very interesting, nice session. Thank you. And surprising to know about each scratching the other's back. <laughs> <laughs> So this question has come from Mrs. Rita Bose, Kolkata. Well, you know, it's it's. Let's face it, America is a much more materialistic society than India. 
Not that we are now less materialistic, but those days certainly India was a different country. You know, as I mentioned, this was in 88 or 87 it happened. So we're talking of uh, 35 years ago, we're talking. Americans have always uh, indulged in such things and uh, they probably still do. I don't, I don't travel all that uh, much uh, now. So this was an easy way because uh, these guys had fat expense allowances and uh, probably the company managements also knew that some of the guys would be doing that, but they didn't bother about it. They said, okay, if the guy is making $50 extra, so what the hell with it? Let's not forget about it. And uh, then, then we're all familiar with what happened in Enron and what has happened with many of the other countries and the other companies in USA. <clears throat> so it's, it's, it, I mean, now I don't feel surprised. At that time, it was a big surprise for me because I had never ever, you know, one, one went to restaurants here, so one would get a proper bill, itemized bill, all the prices, tax, this, that, and all that. But that was the first time I just got the little receipt and uh, stamped an initial receipt and the amount uh, left uh, black. So you feel <laughs> what you feel like. They probably also realized that 20% uh, tip was quite a uh, penalizing one. So let the people not feel so bad about it as long as they can uh, cheat their own company and make up for that tip also. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, so so we, how long you were there? Can I ask one? How long you, you yes. how long you were there in the States? What else I did mean, you find out about the culture of America? They are very, very right. materialistic, no doubt about it. I would you like know, to now, now if you ask me to comment on the culture of America, there are good things about America. Let's face it, the best educational institution, the best research facility, the best universities are all in America followed only by other countries. Or when I say all, I mean most of them are in America. Americans are very particular. You walk into a shop, even if you walked into a shop just to ask the way to another shop, the guy will never fail to say, have a nice day. It comes to them mechanically. They are very thorough in their narrow field of work. You know, they are, there's a highly specialized, high, high degree specializes in them. If in a factory, a guy, now of course the factories are largely automated, but if a guy is to just tighten two screws in an automotive factory, he would just tighten those two screws all his life, but he would do a perfect job of it. They would not take that easy. So they're very professional, much more professional than uh, most yeah. of us are. But at the same time, I'm repeating myself, they're more materialistic. They would, uh, I, I'll, I'll give you an incident. It's actually in one of my stories also. I was in. Manju? I was yeah. heading to Newark Airport. Some friend had dropped me at a point. He said, "It's only five minutes from here. Take a cab. I'm getting late for my office." So I stood there. Ten minutes passed, and no cab would stop. It was rush hour, morning hour, and finally, one guy with a huge, big Oldsmobile limousine stopped, and he says, "Yes." I said, "Can you drop me, sir, at the Newark Airport? I'm going to miss my flight." He says, "Hop in. It'll be ten dollars." The guy was suited well and said it was driving a big car, but he did not hesitate. I thought he was joking, but anyway, I got in the car because I wanted uh, to reach there in five minutes. Sure enough, we were there. He says, here you are. I thanked him again, and I was making a motion to get out. He says, what happened to $10? I told you about it. I wasn't joking. So I gave him $10. Now, okay, the guy helped me. I would have even paid him $50 at that time if he had asked yeah. for it. But he just asked for $10. I knew he was a well-to-do guy. One could see his car, one could see his suit, one could see his shirt, a lot of files lying at the back seat and things like that. But that's the way they are. I mean, I, I, I would hesitate to do that even today in India, asking somebody. First thing, of course, one is scared to give a lift to somebody. But if I am giving a lift to somebody... I mean, I, I even if I have to go out of the way, I don't think any Indian will ask for money. So those are cultural differences. There are many more. There are many more. Mm. But you are right. When you say even the Indians, they have become very materialistic. Even there is a way. Even we are and very much. Similarly, every country, Nirmala Japanese are very different. 
totally different. I think the Japanese are from a different planet. Germans are very different. They're very exacting, very uh, nice, very good. But then they have their own modes. Uh, every country, I think, that the Scandinavian yeah. countries are different. Russians are different. And uh, Chinese, of course, these days it's uh, politically unwise to talk about the Chinese. The Chinese are different from everyone else. And uh, so uh, I guess every country does have uh, some features which are special to them. Why are you talking about foreign countries? You talk about India. Yes. The people in Manipur, Nagaland, uh, where I have lived for 10 long years, and the people in Coimbatore and the people in Ludhiana are totally different Absolutely. In, every, in every possible way, not one way. Yes, what, what binds us together is our heritage, our culture. Uh, overall, we are the same, but in hundreds of ways, we are so different. No, no, you're absolutely right. In fact, one of my stories is, uh, I think the title of the story is uh, Traveling Easy or something like that. It's the story of a friend of mine, Sindhi gentleman, traveling with somebody from Tamil Nadu, and what a contrast between their uh, ways. They were in a coupe for 36 hours. Those were the days when it used to take 36 <laughs> hours to reach Madras, uh, now called Chennai. And, uh, you know, the huge differences. Uh, people from the South, generally, particularly from Tamil Nadu, are very simple, very, very down to earth, very simple, whereas uh, North Indians, and uh, I'm sorry, there might be Sindhis in the crowd, particularly Sindhis and Punjabis uh, show off a lot. I'm a Punjabi, <laughs> but I know that my community is a big show off most of the time. So that, that, that those are, you know, those, those become yeah. your, uh, uh, the way you live. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I think we would love to hear many, many more stories from you, sir. But it's time to end the session now. So I would like to thank you again. And if there are any concluding remarks, from your side and then we would end. No, I have no remarks. I'm very happy. I want to again thank all the people. Who sir, it was very fascinating stories were very fascinating and interesting. We would like to have more sessions like this. Anytime. Anytime. Hey. I have 300 stories to share. I've shared wow. only five today. <laughs> yeah. Anytime. Looking forward to seeing yeah. Do you have a copy of the book around? If it up uh, for our audience. I, I don't have a copy, but I think it should be available on Flipkart or Amazon. It should be. All available. right. Sure. It was sure. there unless they've taken it off. I have no idea. This is what the book looks like. Thank uh, you. But if you have a problem, do let me know. I'll ask the publishers to send you up. Thank you so much. So they, you. Should, they should have a few copies lying. It's 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 not a book which has sold in thousands and thousands. It's a, it's a small quantity that has sold, but uh, uh, I like the stories that I wrote and I feel happy about it. So does my family and so do my friends. So I, think, I, think <laughs> we, I think we will rather rather have more sessions by you and listen to you. Yes. It'll, it'll, be my, it'll be my honor and my pleasure. I agree with you. Right to listen to you, there's something else to say. Absolutely. 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 Absolut